Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Seth Manukin. I'm a, an associate professor in comparative media studies and writing here at MIT uh, and the director of the communications forum. Um, I'm thrilled that you're all here for this tonight. Uh, this is a forum um, that I feel really strongly about, and I'm very glad that we're getting to hold it. Um, one correction to your programs. Uh, Nadim, uh, unfortunately, was booked uh, here and at someplace else simultaneously. Uh, his assistant apparently had two events and decided instead of working out that conflict, he would just marry them um, and make them one event. Uh, so he texted us a little while ago saying, why aren't any of you at Suffolk? Um, <laughs> so uh, he will not be here, um, but Hisham uh, will be here in his place. Um, and so without further ado, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, down on the end, uh, Abu Bakar Abid is an engineering master's student at MIT uh, and a member of the Muslim Students Association, Muslim Student Association. Uh, he is currently working on building wireless communications and powering systems for edible electronics, which um, sounds delicious and awesome. <laughs> uh, um, Layla Shakley holds a master's degree from uh, MIT's School of Architecture and Planning, and she's the co-founder of Wise Systems, a software firm that helps companies make real-time delivery decisions, uh, and the co-founder of TEDx Baghdad. Her viral video sensation, which we will definitely be talking about, um, Muslim Hipsters, or Mipsters, uh, helped launch a national conversation about how Muslim women are represented. Um, and... Uh, Hisham Bedri is also an alumni of MIT from the Technology and Policy Program, uh, where he studied new imaging technologies and their implication on privacy. Uh, he was born in the Sudan uh, and grew up in my hometown, in my hometown of Newton, Mass. Um, uh, so, which makes me very proud. Um, and again, thank you so much for uh, stepping in literally at the last second. Um, so. Uh, Abu Bakar, I thought I would um, start with you. Um, and one of the reasons I thought I'd start with you is because initially the other two panelists were going to have a fairly public profile. Uh, but um, I, I, Leila, I know you've dealt with um, reactions online to your, uh, to your work and to you. Um, and I wanted to know um, from you, if Abu Bakar, if uh, over the last six months or so, um, since the rhetoric around this presidential campaign has, in a bunch of cases, become pretty hateful, um, if you have noticed any difference or if you've uh, um, felt any different within MIT, uh, and then a follow-up to that is, um, has anyone in the MIT community uh, since um, you know, Donald Trump said that Islam hates us uh, or since Ted Cruz said that we should be patrolling Muslim neighborhoods, has anyone within MIT um, uh, spoken to you or the Muslim Student Association about what's going on? Thank you, Seth. Seth. Um, first of all, I want to thank you and the rest of the team for organizing this. And, and I want to thank everyone in the audience for coming out. I think this is a very, very important um, and critical, crucial discussion that we need to be having right now, especially given the kind of political discourse that we're hearing. And uh, this kind of discourse does have an effect. So as Seth, as you alluded, you know, a lot of uh, people on the trail have talked about the fact that Muslims, there's an inherent divide between Muslims and the rest of American society. And as a consequence, I've actually heard, um, I've heard effects both happening here at MIT as well as in the larger American uh, landscape. In fact, I, just a couple of weeks ago, I talked to an MIT um, a Muslim student who told me that, uh, so she's a, she's a Muslim woman, she wears the hijab, she's very visible, uh, she's a very visible Muslim. And she told me about a series of disturbing incidents that she had experienced over the course of just a couple of months after these incendiary remarks had started. So one of the things that she told me was that, you know, she experienced, just as she was grabbing uh, lunch at one of the cafes around campus, that one of the servers started shouting at her and accusing her of all sorts of terrible things. Um, and this she, on campus? On, on, on campus, yeah. On campus. Yeah, on campus. And this, unfortunately, you know, in, in another incident, same person uh, asked she was boarding a safe ride, ironically, a, a safe ride. 
um, she uh, was singled out and asked for identification, whereas all of the other passengers, passengers weren't. And there were other incidents as well, but the point is that um, I think that I, I think there's a couple of things. One, that these incidents are happening, but two, that even me as a Muslim student on campus, I was surprised and shocked to hear these. And I think that points to the fact that anti-Muslim sentiment, as in you know, as other examples of bigotry against minority groups, it isn't uniform. It tends to target people who are the, already the most visible and potentially the most vulnerable in that group. And I think it's important if we want to actually get a sense of what's going on to get as many different, uh, to seek out as many different narratives and voices and hear from everyone. I think that's the best way of, uh, of understanding what's happening. And so has anyone at, at MIT or within the MIT community um, uh, come and spoken to you or said that they support you or spoken to the student association? Yeah, so we're fortunate. I think one of the one of the one of the great things about the MSA, the Muslim Students Association on campus, is that it serves as a vehicle for um, interfaith dialogue, for uh, building rapport with other student groups on campus. And so we're fortunate to have good relationships with, uh, with, for example, MIT Hillel. We've had joint uh, uh, events with Crew, with the secular student group. And so we have received a strong amount of solidarity and messages of support from these other religious groups. And we're very grateful, actually, to the, uh, um, I know Rabbi Fisher actually reached out to us specifically, specifically supporting, uh, what, you know, as a sign of solidarity with the Muslim students on campus. And we've had similar support, statements of support from other groups. So we're seeing both. You know, on one level, organized student groups and most students on campus, I think, are supportive of the Muslim, MIT Muslim students. Here, but at the same time, we are seeing these occasional incidents where Muslim students feel threatened and feel vulnerable. And and uh, it sounds like you're being very politic, but should I? Am I correct in assuming that no one in the administration has reached out to you? Oh no, I, abs they have actually. Oh, okay. oh absolutely. Okay. That's okay. just an omission on my po no, no. my point. Both the president. We recently met with the VP, and they've been extremely extremely supportive. Okay, great. Um, uh, Layla, uh, so I mentioned um, your Muslim hipsters video. Um, I'm going to assume that not everyone is familiar with it. Um, so I want to know if you could tell us uh, a little bit about that and then also a little bit about the reaction to that. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here tonight. So thank you guys for coming. Um, to make the very clear distinction, I always... Um, so... Abu Bakr has done this incredible job in taking leadership within the Muslim community and really trying to be a leader and, and developing the MSA here. I'm totally here by accident, and I'm generally at these events by accident, and I effectively became a public figure by accident. Um, so to give you, to kind of take 10 steps back, I was a teenager when 9-11 happened, and I saw the big shift of the perception of Muslim women, right? Before 9-11, my mom wore, wore the hijab, the scarf, and my sister did, and it was usually fine. You know, people would ask, do you get hot in that? Do you shower in that? But that was effectively the extent of, of you know, the funny remarks that we would hear. After 9-11, um, with this otherization of Muslims across America that we'd all experienced, alongside, I would say, a lack of really differentiating reporting that indicated kind of the, the realities of, of Muslims in America and really the fact that we are just generally citizens um, led, led to this otherization of, of us as a population. And I would say that Muslim women, and especially those who choose to cover, were typically the first victims of this, right? Alongside random people like Sikh men who aren't even Muslim. But, you know, people were so upset that they, they just unfortunately bared the brunt of the storm as well. Um, I happen to be one of those Muslim women, and I, I chose to cover growing up, and I, I, I still choose to cover. And um, it really led to an adolescence of apologeticness, quite frankly. You know, that's not like me. I'm not like them. I like fashion. I like tech. Um, I worked at NASA. I'm like some literally tech geek, right? And there was a certain point, I would say, when I hit 18, 19, 20, that I realized that I was just... I was over it. The jig was up. What was I apologizing for? And why did I spend so much of my effort and my energy apologizing for something that I was unrelated for? We're all Americans. We should not all be apologizing for Donald Trump if you don't support him. If you do, I mean, okay, bad example. We're just going to stay out of that. Nevertheless, um, we shouldn't all be apologizing for, for the KKK. That happened in America. If you're unrelated and you don't respect it, it's a really unfortunate set of circumstances and type of person, but they don't represent us. We feel the same way about, you know, these, these fringe terrorist groups. Nevertheless, um, I decided to take action instead of just be angry and upset, and my passions were 
tech, space, and fashion. Um, I was much better at being a creative than I was creating cool rockets. So I, and my friends and I put together a music video, ironically enough, to Jay-Z's Somewhere in America, and it was really an authentic video, really benign video of a bunch of Muslim American women doing what they love to do most. I used to love to skateboard. I still enjoy it. I can't say I have the time. I'm also 30, so it's getting to the age where it's kind of embarrassing. Um, but I was, I was skateboarding. I that's not true, because I'm 43, and I still have my I'm skateboard. I'm like so not so. politically correct tonight. <laughs> Actually, uh, I'm taking my engagement pictures on a skateboard. And <laughs> so effectively, my friends and I put together the, this video, and um, we released it to the internet, not expecting much more than kind of creating some sense of awareness to people who weren't Muslim. That was our target audience. Um, I happened to be in Egypt at the time on a UN mission, so it was my nighttime when it was daytime here, and we read all like you know the statistics on when the best time to drop a video was, and I woke up in the morning and effectively had gone literally insanely viral, and I was like, oh my goodness, like, what, what do I do now? I'm in Egypt, I'm on a UN mission, like what if they see me on heels and a skateboard? Like, is this gonna affect my job? Um, so I rushed back to the United States. That's not true, it just happened to be the end of my mission. And um, I, got, I got back to the stateside and realized this, this whole incredible dialogue had formed. And the first people to take up the dialogue were Muslims. Um, Muslims saying, hey, dude, like, this doesn't represent me, so I'm not really sure why you put this out there. To which my response was like, that's great. That's the point. Like, we're not one person. We're many different people, and this is my narrative. Um, I let that kind of settle out for, for a few months, and then the response came from the mainstream, and we were picked up from everybody, from GQ to Cosmo to Glamour. I think I'm the first woman in GQ who isn't in a bikini. It's incredible. <laughs> um, to Cosmo to Glamour to Marie Claire. And we, I just kind of watched. I sat back and watched as this dialogue really formed on who Muslim women are, what they're supposed to represent, who can speak on their behalf. What is a Muslim woman? How, how loaded is this statement? How loaded is this piece of cloth? So as this incredible, incredible dialogue literally evolved and this video became oddly iconic, um, I, I just took a step back and soaked it up and then in fact, eventually wrote a piece in The Atlantic just summarizing it all that if you're interested in this, I suggest you, you read because it really is a very open view straight from the depths of my heart to this whole experience. Um, I think I've probably spoken too much, but I have a lot more to say, so I'm going to let you ask questions before okay. I keep we, talking. We, we, can, we can come back to that, but, but yeah. just um, briefly, so what were, uh, so you said some of the reactions were, um, uh, you know, this isn't what we are as Muslim women. Um, what were the reactions from the mainstream press when GQ or Marie Claire covered you? What, was, what were they covering, essentially? Muslim women are so cool. These women are so hip. Muslim women into fashion, like stylish Muslim women. Um, it was all about just effectively this particular uh, medium of creativity we had chosen, which was fashion. Right. Um, and they were just talking about, I mean, one of the women who was in our video is now the first Olympian for Team USA to wear hijab, Ibtihaj Muhammad. She's the fencer? She's the fencer, so she's in our video. She's incredible. Um, my sister's in it, who happens to be the attorney for the, for the Clinton Foundation, for President Clinton, who's like a rock star, undercover. Um, pun intended. And... Yeah, thanks for catching that. <laughs> um, so there was a lot of really clearly intelligent women, and some women chose to be artists or, you know, community builders, but we really focused on the fashion. So people who effectively would delve deeper would be like, whoa, this keeps getting cooler. Like, what? She's super smart. She's doing such cool things. So I think it was just a lot of awareness to kind of another angle of Muslim women in America that, quite frankly, isn't, isn't represented often enough. And I'll take some blame for that, because as a Muslim woman, I could probably represent it myself, which is why I did what I did. Um, Hisham, so when did you, when did your family move over, and did they move directly from the Sudan to Newton? Yeah, so actually, uh, we moved over when I was maybe about a year and a half years old. So I don't really remember Sudan very much so at all. Was in the maybe 90s? Yeah, we'll go with 90s. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's was, no, earlier than that. Earlier than that. Earlier um, than that. Yeah, okay. yeah. But uh, yeah, so I guess uh, I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts, which I would say is probably predominantly Jewish. Um, and so I had lots of Jewish friends growing up and I went to lots of bar and bar mitzvahs and it was actually a very good experience. Um, and I would say that uh, so I so I I think Part of that, you know, experience has shown. I mean, I think um, so. A uh, great book that everyone should probably read is *Kristallnacht* by uh, Eli Wiesel. And essentially, they're they're talking about the issues of the Holocaust, and more importantly, also the issues of what led up to the Holocaust. And the, trust me, this is 
<laughs> not to compare directly anything to the Holocaust, but what I want to do is, you know, they do t talk into the concepts of hate, how that really grows up and how that happens. Um, and I could say that, you know, uh, beyond just like the physical or even, you know, mental stress that Muslims get placed under, there's also the concept that their struggle, Muslim struggle, is very much associated with like the American struggle in general. Um, and I think that unhinged remarks against Mexicans or women or even, you know, Muslims and everything like that, you know, sort of shows that, you know, that we're sort of being placed in a situation where we are definitely otherizing. And the issue when happens when you begin otherizing is you start seeing things like hate and the others. Um, ultimately, I think the antidote to that, and I think Eli Vizal talks about that a lot, is you, know, you really need to start standing up for other people. Um, anytime you, you start say, standing, standing up for other, up people. other people or anytime something happens, you need to understand that that's, you know, like it's a direct attack on me just as much as a direct attack on, on other people. Um, as soon as we see like underrepresented voices or minorities in check like that, I think you're going to see... Uh, you know, essentially other dire consequences happening. Um, unfortunately, I think that these environments essentially lead to situations wherein it only takes a small lapse of judgment. Um, and it's not necessarily going to be you or me or anybody we know, but I mean, ultimately, like, you could be in a situation where the cards don't go in your favor and this environment essentially pulls out the entire safety net. Meaning what? what a small lapse of judgment meaning what? Uh, so, for example, I think... Um, I mean, everyone you know, undergoes feelings of panic. Of course, there was a story of recently there was um, a Muslim woman on a train who was, uh, I think, literally just going to work. I don't remember the exact details of the story, but she was really going to work. And on the train, she was approached by many different passengers asking if what she was carrying was a bomb or not. Um, and that's a situation that could immediately you know, escalate into something which nobody involved would ever want. Um, and so a little bit of, you know, like uh, suspicion, you know, in this kind of environment can easily escalate to something which could be extremely dire. So the point is, we build these safety nets to not just protect ourselves, but to protect those around us. And I think that, you know, as soon as we see kind of hate speech flying, we have to realize that, you know, it's going to affect everyone, anyone who's an underrepresented minority, anyone who has a voice that's different from other people. And in the end, that's what a democracy is about. We all have voices which are slightly different. We need the room to be controversial. We need the room to also be different. And without that kind of safety net, we're going to essentially see bad stuff happening. And so the, that, that's interesting. And it, uh, it reminds me of, um, I think, in 2014 in Sydney, uh, there was, after a gunman held people hostage in a cafe, there was a, um, was it I'll Ride With You, the I'll Ride With You movement, where... Yeah. Uh, um, where Australians were uh, speaking out and saying publicly, um, if you are Muslim and are worried about uh, being harassed, I'll walk with you, I'll ride with you. Sure. Um, have you seen similar things happening here? Uh, yeah, for sure. I think, yeah. I think, uh, uh, let me come up with some specific examples of Abu Bakr, and all right, you guys are going to have to yeah, help me dig uh, one, but I think. You can um, jump in. Yeah. yeah. But I would say that, you know, I think in general, the MIT community has been extremely supportive. I think a lot of the interfaith community here at MIT is also extremely supportive, as well as, you know, like uh, the higher up, you know, um, administration level. But I think in general, most MIT students are just great people to talk to, great people to, um, you know, uh, just have a conversation with. And I think that really becomes a thing. I would say from my experience, I've yet to meet somebody who hate Muslims. Uh, I've met, I haven't met somebody who hates Muslims who knows a Muslim. I think that oftentimes that becomes a problem. That essentially, we are a minority. We aren't necessarily out there. And just like you were saying, very underrepresented. So what happens is you have lots and lots of people who've never met Muslims before, who are only see like, the bad things, which are essentially just serialized in the media. And essentially, things become bad. No. Where are you going to jump no, in? I'm yeah. just, I can just add on to that. I think one of the, one of the issues is while, uh, while Muslims are fairly integrated in, 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 in the United States, there are huge pockets of geographical areas where there aren't many Muslims. And in fact, uh, the problem is that you know, people living in those areas don't know many Muslims. And they are, because of that, they're resistant to learning about Muslims. And oftentimes, you hear stories, for example, where, um, uh, where parents are concerned about their children learning about Islam or Muslim Muslims in schools. And so there, there, there was this recent story where, for example, a school district in Virginia uh, shut down because the one of, the, one of the parents saw that their children were learning about Arabic calligraphy in class. And so that kind of resistance to education about Islam and Muslim, I think, creates this unfortunate cycle where you have people just never learning about Islam and Muslims, and that perpetuates anti-Muslim sentiment, and you just see it persist. So I think it's very important to actually 
uh, end this cycle before before it becomes you know continues to be a problem. And so outside, uh, you know, we're we're within a community um, that is not representative of the United States. Obviously, I'm talking about MIT um, in some ways. Yes. Uh, um, uh, probably in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, so outside of a university setting, um, uh, are there steps that are being taken or that should be taken? Um, you know, you, you talked about speaking out against uh, when you see hate. Um, and if you look at, again, you know, what Ted Cruz has been saying, what Donald Trump has been saying, um, what on a local level politicians have been saying uh, across the country, um, it's pretty scary stuff. Uh, and in my perception, at least from outside of the Muslim community, is that it has not been met with as robust a, 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 a reaction against that um, as you might see. Yeah, I mean, are you talking about from outside of the Muslim community or within? From outside of the Muslim community. Yeah, from outside of the Muslim community, absolutely, which, um, I mean, it's a tough issue, right? Because within the Muslim community, you hear this criticism sometimes from the outside saying, well, if you're not one of them, why don't you stand up against it? And first of all, many Muslims, if you're not one of them, like one of them, terrorist. meaning a terrorist, effectively, why right. don't you stand up against it? And the truth is, if you check any of our Twitters after any attack, it's always a clear, like, you know, hearts out to the victims, et cetera, et cetera. But th there's a real reality to it. And the reality is that ultimately, when people, when especially a whole population of people, spend their time being defensive, they're not doing something else. So when I'm not being defensive about who I am, I'm usually building something. In the, at the moment, building a company, right? to effectively be a good daughter, a good sister, um, really contributing to something greater. And I think that that is really one of the biggest challenges of people our age who happen to be Muslim is there's so much energy that as a result of this lack of education is being wasted on being defensive and being apologetic when effectively at the end of the day I'm unapologetically American. Um, and there's really nothing, nothing for me to apologize about. <laughs> and 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 you you uh, you raised you know the, the the fact that oftentimes after a terrorist attack or even not after a terrorist attack, um, uh, you'll have people saying, "Well, why isn't the Muslim community speaking out about this?" Um, do you think that that's a situation where when uh, Muslims do speak out, it's not getting covered, or that people aren't speaking out? Uh, within the community for fear of drawing attention to themselves or something else? No, I think, I think everybody, anybody who's afraid is gone by now. <laughs> it's what, been so, what do you mean? In other words, after their September 11th, there was awful events like, you know, Belgium, there was San Bernardino. If you're scared of being a Muslim, you've cut, you're out. Like, you're not, you're you not, you've, left the, you've left the maybe affiliation, the association, you've Americanized yourself, you've assimilated in other ways, and you're not partaking. So now you've left the U.S., but no, you've you're left the You're not partaking with that identity. And we, we all have friends like that, and that's fine who just effectively don't want to deal with the criticism and have assimilated in ways that they've effectively absolved or left their, their original identities, and that's not my choice to make, right? So a lot of the Muslims that you see now that are choosing to look and be Muslim have made a very conscious decision to do what we're doing. Right. Um, because there's been many, like, opportunities to walk out on the identity as a whole, <laughs> I would say, for, for Muslims my age. It has to be a choice um, because you are constantly dealing with so much backlash on an everyday level, like... To be quite honest, I was at the airport yesterday. I didn't even think twice. I just put a hood on. I'm like, I'm not going to wear my hijab. I don't want to put up with this. Right. You know, like, I, I need to get to Boston. I don't want to be randomly selected again. So um, I think that especially as a woman, because that's what I can especially speak for, it's a really conscious decision to be and look like a Muslim woman today in America. Hey, Hisham, do you, do you find that that's true, that, um, that among your peers, you know, for, I guess in contrast, uh, I don't necessarily identify myself as being religiously Jewish, but identify as being culturally Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like what you're saying is that uh, um, uh, people who might identify as culturally Muslim, but not necessarily religious, are essentially just not even, are, are, are saying, well, I'm not even going to identify myself as cultural, culturally Muslim. Is that? Is I, uh, so are you saying that, well, I think, among many Muslim communities, I think you're going to find that, you know, like, no matter how far away people, I guess, are from the mosque or where they live mm -hmm. or, you know, something like that, there is, you know, like, this very, very strong identity. 
um, like the Muslim identity is still like you know a strong part of their lives. Um, and I say that comparatively because you know I have lots of friends who are you know not necessarily religious or anything like that. I could say that you know comparatively like you know like the Muslim identity is something that you know still plays a part even if like you know you haven't been you know to the mosque ever in your life, you know, um, you barely know very much about the religion or anything like that, but you're still, like, you still have, like, this feeling. And that's not going to speak for everyone, but I can say that, on the whole, if we were, like, took, like, the, the mean compared to people who are, you know, not necessarily Muslim, I think it's, you know, you know they, like, there's, there's something that people essentially do like about this thing. So, but I would say this. Um, do the, like about this thing you mean do like, like about like, like they, 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 they still are able to like you know hold on to that identity and maybe it's because we can't necessarily even you know uh, like escape it you know like there are so many situations where that you know like identity will come up you brought up an extremely good point being a Muslim woman in America you, like you're essentially that identity is on the forefront all the time um, but I think that uh, to your earlier point, do people feel, you know, like they need to be apologetic or anything like that? I think that regardless, I think when people get hurt, I think Muslims definitely feel that hurt. We're just as American as everybody else. And if you were even to add a layer of extra extraction to that, I think you see that, you know, overseas, terrorists are killing more Muslims than anybody else. Yeah, right. um, so it's, you know, like, uh, and not only that, you know, like when a terrorist attack happens, you know, first reaction is, oh my God, this is absolutely terrible. Second reaction is, Oh my God! This is about to be even more terrible because there's going to be you know a backlash right. that goes apart. That, but I think that's just I think you know like that's. But I would say uh, there's definitely three examples I can think of on top of my head that um, of people who are not necessarily Muslim but who have done great ways of essentially making it easier for Muslims. Um, so this goes way back, but I think um, at the top level, I think Colin Powell, when Barack Obama was running for president, mm -hmm. um, essentially there was a lot of talk about, oh my God, Barack Obama's a Muslim, oh my God, he's a Muslim. I think Colin Powell still came out and said- talk about that. Exactly. Um, but I think Colin Powell's response is still really important. He said, you know, he is A, not a Muslim, and B, even if he was, it shouldn't matter. Um, right. And I think, you know, being of the Bush administration, standing out like that, it showed that, you know, I think um, he was one not to be bullied around. Although the, the Bush incredible. administration in general, you know, the, the, at least right after 9-11, George W. Bush's rhetoric was certainly very embracing of American Muslims. At, there, that's my memory. There's, that's also, my, there's always a right. filter of media, I think, that, that, that goes there. And I think that um, if you were to look at, like, uh, in practice, a lot of the policies that happened, sure, that the right. exact opposite happened. Yeah, <laughs> um, right, uh, right. So I think, uh, but, uh, and the second example I want to bring up um, is actually at MIT, and I'm sorry to call you out for this, but Dean Randolph, I think, um, was after um, the, uh, uh, essentially, uh, the, I think it was the San Bernardino shootings. Um, we were going to have um, Muslim prayer um, on Fridays, um, and then he went ahead and he called a police officer to just be outside the uh, the mosque, you know, like when um, when that happened. So right. that was just really great, and that was him, you know, standing up and saying, you know, like. I want to ensure the safety of you know MIT Muslims. I want to ensure the safety of people who are faithful. I'm not sure if it's it? calling someone out if you're complimenting them. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, no. I think I think you know. I think, there's some really humble people right, here. Right, you know, right. they, and the, the last example, I really got to say this. Um, so I, I work at this electronics store, and um, there was somebody there, and, and they don't know I'm Muslim at all. Um, and I was walking by um, two coworkers talking, and I'm sorry to bring racism, but they were they were they were both white. It's all good. They were they're, they're really cool people. Um, and essentially, um, some of my best friends are white. I know. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and um, so, and then I just overheard the conversation, and then I think one guy was saying to the other guy, he was just like, you know, just explaining that, you know, like, you know, there's a, over a billion Muslims on this planet, you know, like, and like you're saying, ISIS is like 50,000 people, like that represents 0.001 percent, and that if even if there was a significant part of them that were dangerous, none of us would even exist. And then he kept going and talking about, like, you know, like, all, like all like the, the actual just literal facts of the situation. Um, I suggest people to check out uh, Savages. It's a song in the Pocahontas movie, um, and I think it, it can it can look at it can really describe you know a lot of the things that are going on um, today. Essentially, sides are becoming polarized, and it's really over nothing. Um, and essentially, when you start down and look at the facts, there's nothing but really good opportunities. Um, I think hate is like this really weird thing that, uh, like you're saying, it's like this it just uh, there's there's a nonlinear effect. That occurs when you start dealing with hate. Um, but so, so um, you know, we're, we're we're talking about examples of people outside the Muslim community standing up and and uh, um, making both saying that this is wrong and making Muslims feel uh, welcome and accepted. Um, the fact that the examples that we come up with are. Colin Powell from eight years ago, uh, a dean at MIT, two random white dudes, and a Disney movie um, uh, doesn't uh, make me feel like there is a lot going on. 
um, uh, in our in our culture as a whole. Is that and and anyone can jump in. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's real interesting. Go on. No, go for it. So there's one example I can think of. Um, I would say on the culture as a whole, um, probably not. You're correct. But it's, it's, it's a challenging topic, right? Because, I mean, what are you going to do as somebody who's not Muslim who wants to support Muslims, hold a sign up and walk around and be like, I support Muslims? I mean, the, the real right thing sure, to do is right. to kind of have more events like this and, and, and create more, use whatever kind of leverage you have and especially outlets to different news news channels and, and media outlets to kind of spread a different alternative narrative, because there's effectively one very overbearing narrative out there right now. I would say in the last three, four years, the narrative has become a bit more diverse, and you see a lot a lot um, different angles kind of coming out about, about Muslims, particularly in America. But so, to, yeah, yeah, go no, on. Go on, no, no. Go but on. to go back to your initial question, my mom is like this incredible rock star. She was at one point in her life an orthodontist, quit that to open a Muslim school, pre-K through 12, City of Knowledge in Pomona, California, best place on earth. Waska credited. And um, she, after 9-11, when I was in middle school, I think, I remember that morning, or the next morning when school was back, back in place, um, local Jews and Christians from the local interfaith community literally stood by the gate every day before school and after school so students would come and go and feel comfortable. And they did that for weeks and weeks. It was incredible. And my mom called me after the San Bernardino attacks happened, because San Bernardino is about 40, minute, 40 miles away from Pomona. And the, the same community had done the exact same thing. And it was the most simple thing. I mean, 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the afternoon. Right. But it truly, like, resonated with her. Um, so you, you'll see random effects like this, particularly in focused communities, like interfaith communities, et cetera. But I think the issue is much, much larger than kind of random acts of kindness. At this point, it's widespread acts of information that really might mitigate. Right, yeah. right. Uh, Abu Bakr, uh, it, we were talking earlier, and I know you haven't read it yet, but um, about uh, an, a fascinating article in BuzzFeed about the experience of Muslims living in Tennessee and how radically that has shifted um, from feeling incredibly integrated. And actually, uh, one of the reasons that some of the Muslims, in, quoted in the piece, uh, said they felt so integrated was because um, they could relate and identify very clearly with the evangelical population around them. Um, that that was a population that took faith as seriously as they were taking it, um, and there was sort of a, a, a brotherhood there. Um, uh, the article ultimately is about um, now how that feeling of acceptance has sort of disappeared. Uh, you is your family still in Arkansas? So my family is now in yeah Fayetteville, Arkansas. And so what has their experience been, uh, not just now, but over the past you know, 16, 17 years? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I think we talked about earlier how you know, maybe some Muslims are choosing to identify or become less visibly Muslim. So I think what I, what I see more ha happening more than that is people choosing to become um, less politically outspoken, less, uh, um, uh, less along the lines of you know, calling out government surveillance programs of Muslims, any, any way that they can choose to draw attention, less attention to themselves. I hear this all the time, for example, from my parents, who tell me, don't do anything political. <laughs> That's like the number one piece of advice I get from them. Just don't do anything political. Everything else is fine. Um, and I, you know, even, for example, I, 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 uh, a couple years ago, I, I served as the president of the MIT Muslim Students Association. And even that f was, um, to a lot of people, a lot of my relatives, a lot of you know, my parents, said, you know, are you, sure, are you really sure you want to draw that kind of attention to yourself? And I think that is the real toll that a lot of Muslims are taking, is that they are way more hesitant to call out, for example, aggressive foreign policy, uh, domestic surveillance programs, right. um, even some of the extreme rhetoric that you're hearing. That's continuing because a lot of Muslims just don't want to challenge that. Because, you know, for example, um, you have candidates like Ted Cruz and Donald Trump calling out, let's, let's patrol Muslim neighborhoods. Now, you can't really identify a Muslim neighborhood, but you can identify a Muslim who's speaking, you know, outs outspoken about these kind of issues. So a lot of people are just taking a step back and saying, okay, there's a risk involved, I don't want to be a part of it. And that's, again, you know, this is another vicious cycle that allows these politics, you know, these, these uh, discourse to go unchallenged and these policies to persist. So I think that's the real, real um, uh, 
real toll of these kind of these kind of dis, uh, discussions. Well, and and um, we can refer to the ghost of Nadim uh, now. <laughs> um, uh, one of the one of the things you know he, he's I think the first Muslim elected official in Massachusetts. Um, uh, he's also been very active. Um, he started Mass Muslims in. Uh, um, organizing the Muslim community, especially the younger Muslim community, um, politically. Is there the type of generational divide that is discussed where uh, maybe people in your parents' generation um, would prefer not to get involved politically, um, where people in, in, in our, or if I don't qualify, your generation, um, uh, are at least uh, looking for how to how to navigate that, how to both um, speak out about what they believe in uh, and also um, exist safely and comfortably within the society. And anyone can jump in on this. Mm. Is there a generational divide? Yeah, I certainly see a, a generational divide. Um, part it's either generational or it could be you know cultural. People who have come to the United States uh, as first generation immigrants, they're much less likely to see the value of implementing policy changes. So as long as they live their lives comfortably, they're kind of okay with that. But people who are here in the second generation feel a lot more invested, I think, in the political process. And absolutely, so like Mass Muslims is doing a great job uh, going to Capitol Hill, presenting a list of uh, legislative demands to the Capitol. And I think that's going to be key in kind of getting some of these changes over overturned. Because we don't talk about this, but a lot of the rhetoric that you see on the campaign trail, it doesn't just exist as rhetoric. Like a lot of those policies yeah. have already been implemented. Domestic surveillance, not too different than patrolling neighborhoods or the equivalent. Um, and you know, Im certain immigration policies, certain foreign pol uh, aggressive foreign policies, all of those are already in place. And I think that you know, we, have to, we have to take the step to start challenging that. Well, and you say certain aggressive foreign policies, I and mean, that's one, to me, that's one of the most fascinating areas because certainly um, in the population in general, there are a lot of people who uh, disagree with aspects of American foreign policy over the past decade. Um, but for Muslims to speak out about that publicly seems to carry a, a, a sort of unique, it seems to be fraught in a different way. Um, at least from, from someone looking at it from the outside. Is that true? I definitely, you, people are going to call into question your identity. Uh, if you how play, American you are. Right. I think um, as, you're, as you start challenging foreign policy, like, oh, you care more about these people than you care about your own people or things like that. Um, but uh, I don't think people should be all that worried about that. I think um, there's a lot of foreign policy points that people make which I think are very much universal. I think blowback is a terrible thing and I think that... Uh, I think you'll see amongst many Muslims, you know, like they share the same kind of opinions with, I think, like you mentioned, most of the country that, you know, uh, if you have bad foreign policy, you know, it can lead to bad results in the future. I don't know about yeah. most of the country. Yeah. But <laughs> no, it, feels, no. it might feel like that in Cambridge. But, sure, yeah. sure. I think, yeah. Um, in terms of the generational divide, I think um, what you may see, though, is, uh, I don't know if the, the, the correct term is generational, but I would say that uh, so far from what I've seen, we're just becoming more politicized. I would say that um, Muslim populations, and Nadim has done, the councilman has done a great job in essentially instituting a lot of uh, you know, initiatives and finding people who are very much into politics. Um, but I think that in general in our community, we see a lot of people who are not necessarily in the political end of the spectrum or even in the arts end of the spectrum. You may see a lot of people in science and engineering, which, I mean, of course, for... Uh, there's like uh, like at least 50 percent of our population is immigrants uh, or like came from immigrant backgrounds so you can see that you know typically that is something you would expect from an immigrant population focusing on tech focusing on things that you know will immediately lead to you know like uh, grounding in this country but I think that in general um, uh, politicization of you know like just be able to stand up taking uh, take part uh, participating in like civics and the like is really the exit for Muslims from like this cycle um, right. or at least that's what a lot of people strategize as and I think that uh, you're gonna see more and more of that I mean a good example to prove that is um there's more and more I think just scholarships uh, you know 
pointed towards Muslims, given from Muslims to Muslims, you know, for to for Muslims to go into things like media and arts and. Uh, what do you mean, for Muslims to Muslims? You mean uh, that, that essentially uh, funding given by Muslims for Muslims? You know, essentially internal scholarships, right, things right, like that. Right. Essentially to go into things like media into politics, and I think that's a little bit unheard of because I mean, as I've run high school programs before, it's you know very difficult. Or I think anybody who's trying to get a fellowship in anything liberal arts related. It's really hard, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's yeah. interesting, in this community, that's essentially encouraged. Right. So I think that uh, you will see more politicization, politicization, more people involved in civics, and that's going to be very interesting to see. I think we, our generation certainly is more politicized. I wouldn't tell you that it's per se um, a generational difference. It's generational for sure, but I wouldn't say it's because we tend to be more interested in politics as a whole. I think we have to be. I think that um, particularly right now, it's evident that we're a medium for votes for particular candidates, and a very effective medium for votes. So um, there are some people who are really interested by politics and want to know everything and want to be involved. And there's the rest of us that really should know a thing or two because we're really, really being you know, highlighted in many, many, many times and points of this particular, for example, presidential race and at other right. points. So you kind of have to be fairly political as a young Muslim who chooses to practice and be very, like, you know, outwardly Muslim. Um, because as I said, we're, we're, we're a medium in, in this particular race. Is that, is that do, do you two both agree with that, that to be a religious Muslim um, at this moment in history in the US is inherently a political act as well as a religious act? Yeah, I mean, I'd say for the, I, a lot of people feel like if we're gonna survive as a community and be able to practice effectively, we need to become political. Uh, yet, you know, I, 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 w I would say there are people though that you know choose to distance themselves from the political process for, you know, survival of the self. They don't want to draw attention to themselves. Um, you know, I because I'm in the Muslim community, you hear stories all the time about, for example, the New York Police Department sending undercover agents that pretend to, for example, convert and become Muslims, and then they join the MSAs, they join the Muslim Students Associations. And then they just, you know, they embed themselves as undercover agents. And what that does is, I've had conversations with so many students when I encourage them to, Muslim students, when I encourage them to come to MSA events, and they'll say, ah, you know, I don't know, I, I don't want to be too political. That's their answer. Mm -hmm. Political, not religious, because they're, they're torn, right? So they want to practice their identity, but they just feel so much safer practicing it alone. So I think, you know, for the long-term survival of the Muslim Students Association, yes, absolutely. We need to get engaged with the political process. So what does it say? I mean, one of the interesting reactions um, to the political uh, rhetoric that's occurred over the last couple of months was actually from the commissioner of the NYPD, um, who I thought spoke out. He was among the most forceful people to, spoke out, to speak out right off the bat um, in saying how uh, un-American Ted Cruz's comments were and talking about all the Muslim officers. The fact that you have that coming from an organization that has been really heavily criticized um, for its surveillance tactics. Uh, what, is that, what does that say? Linda Sarsour is doing a great job. <laughs> she's, what? What? Linda Sarsour is doing a great job. No, um, right. she's, uh, so she's, she's, she's also an activist in the area. And I think I'm really glad that he actually came out and did you know, make those comments, because I mean, I think it, uh, and I think what was awesome was seeing those comments on places also like Fox, Fox News and you know broadcasts that you know aren't necessarily usually carrying right. this kind of information. So I think that's absolutely awesome. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more cynical. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that one of the maybe a silver lining in this presidential campaign has is that the uh, for example issues like the surveillance of Muslims has become politicized in the sense that you know one party is now become asso becoming associated with it. So perhaps members of the other party are kind of distancing themselves and say, oh, this is actually not us. Even though maybe five years ago, everyone would have been kind of fine with it. It was kind of low key and it so, was happening. So, but now people are forced to confront it as a political issue. So you think five, because, because certainly both Hillary Clinton and, and Bernie Sanders have <clears throat> spoken out very strongly. You think five years ago, before it had become the political issue it, it is today, that that was not the case or that wouldn't yeah, have been I think, the case? I think you only need to look at the, the change in stance of the police commissioner himself. I don't know if it was the same, same police commissioner, but I'm imagining there was more alignment in policy than there is now. So I think, I think things are changing to that extent, but then the problem with it becoming a political issue is then half the country is now in favor for it and half of it is against it. I mean, we ideally want to get to the point where everyone feels it's wrong. And, and, and what, in favor or against what? Uh, programs like 
keeping a closer tab on Muslims, right. okay. uh, Muslim patrolling, that kind of thing. You can talk about the details of that of that program. It was pretty, pretty oh, crazy. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. The NYPD you know, yeah. program. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, essentially, they 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 had they had essentially been monitoring or surveilling or had informants in essentially. Uh, MSAs and other essentially Muslim and organizations and mosques, um, which here's the critical point, even beyond New York into other states such as New Jersey and uh, the rest of New England. Um, so it was a very large and extensive program. And the thing is that's, you know, these are the programs we learned about now. And essentially the questions are, what are the kind of things that were happening even before? What yeah. are your thoughts about that? Yeah. So I was the one who kind of mentioned that some Muslims don't choose to be political, they just become politicized. I'm one of those. I actually am so deeply engaged in my work that I generally have no idea what's going on. Right, right. So I don't think I'm the right, I don't think I'm the right person to ask for it. I haven't even read enough. I did listen to an incredible NPR story on it that I recommend for everybody who knows very little on the topic, but I don't think I know enough to comment. Yeah, there's, yeah. Also, a, there's also a documentary called Terror that's... Mm. Terror? Yeah, I think that's coming out on Netflix soon. Very interesting. Just called Terror? Yeah, that's I think it's a, just called okay. Terror. Oh, yes, Terror. T, and then in parentheses, error. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, no, but the idea behind that documentary is it's actually very intriguing. They follow a, a live FBI entrapment scheme um, as it's happening. They're able to get some reporters, and apparently the FBI doesn't even know about it. But uh, no, but I think that's really the scary part because it's to the point where, so this whole idea of entrapment where FBI agents are sent to convince potential people to commit crimes and then are, you know, get rewarded essentially for catching them in the act of doing so. Um, and then, or, yeah. And in some cases, pressure those people to uh, then become informants. Right. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. Which, which, yeah. which, which I guess gets me, um, or gets us to one last issue I wanted to talk about uh, um, before we opened it up. Um, Jessica Stern is a, a political scientist at, at BU and possibly also at Harvard. Um, and she has talked about how um, one of the things ISIS is attempting to do is uh, um, essentially make it impossible for there to be moderate Muslims by um, generating so much hate uh, against Muslims that uh, um, Muslims sort of feel uh, um, like radicalization is their only choice at that at that point, and she ta has talked about how uh, that has the potential and has been much more successful in Europe, where the Muslim community is much less integrated. Um, when there are things going on like um, the FBI programs, like the NYPD surveillance programs, um, like Hom Homeland Security surveillance programs. Uh, what are the risks um, of, uh, do those risk, what types of reactions do those risk causing? Hmm. Well, essentially, what type of reactions do, do which, repeat that one. The, 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 um, you know, the, the, the surveillance programs. Oh, I see, I see. Uh, uh, um, you know, if yeah. you are worshiping at a mosque that you find out has not only been under surveillance, but um, had, uh, had, had plants there, uh, or if you're someone who is entrapped and then pressured to become an informant or a situation like that, what, what types of reactions does, does that risk causing? I think the big worry or the big concern is that uh, Muslims will become will go kind of into hiding and not even go to the mosques and institutions. So we know there's been many studies that show that if a Muslim is going to the mosque, is active in their civic organizations, they are much, much less likely to even think about radicalization, right? That's, that's been consistently shown. And so if you scare people, if, you have pro, you know, if people are protesting the buildings of mosques, if people are thinking that, oh, my, my mosque might be bugged, I think then there might be a concern that, um, that, you know, that people are going to get their information from the internet rather than from right. institutions that are actually providing legitimate Islamic information. And so I think the concern isn't so, I, don't, I think it has less to do with homogeneous, like you know, the, the, the po Muslim pockets that are in Europe or that are, may not be here. But I think the concern should be um, making sure that Muslims feel comfortable going to mosques and participating uh, on a civic basis. And Leila, one last question before I open it up. Um, so when you became a, a sort of uh, public figure, 
um, and uh, were kind of held up as a public example of what it meant to be a Muslim woman. Um, uh, were there, did you receive any threats? Did being out in public to that extent um, cause uh, you to ever feel less safe than you had previously? I mean, on the internet, there was a lot of threats. In real life, people were just like, that's cool, you're really cool. But like on the internet, certainly, that's where all the crazies come out, right? Um, and threats are, are along what lines? You'd hear things from like, you know, the, the kind of flip side of the equation that, that really is Islamophobic along the lines of like, you know, you X, Y, Z Muslim, you're all the same. Like, don't try to put some cool pants on it and make it look like it's not threatening. And then, you know, really conservative Muslims who are like, you're not even Muslim dressed like that. You know, what are you doing? So um, I think that's just the reality of life. It didn't really bother. Those aren't threats as much as that's just nasty. It's, it's, it's yeah. Threats as in like feeling I wasn't safe. Yeah, or threats is, is um, even, you know, comments saying, like, someone should do something to you, or... No, I, can't, I mean, I didn't really read too much of the comment section to that's tell you a, that that's, much. That's a good... Yeah, fact. it's generally yeah. something I learned quick. Um, so, no, I can't say I felt any threats. Um, no, I, I can't say that was the case. But I, I was really taken aback by the extent and growth of the conversation itself, because it really proved that there's this incredible vacuum over the topic, right? We're all so deeply kind of involved in this conversation about the fact that we're not terrorists and that I can't even answer your question about homegrown terrorism because I have no points of reference. Right. I'm, I'm scraping right. my brain trying to be like, well, maybe, uh, I don't know. I've never met a homegrown terrorist. Right. And I know like every Muslim in America. Um, <laughs> well, you so, have to, right? right and literally, yeah, right. literally. So um, I, I, think, I think there's a really real reality that there is a huge vacuum of information and of kind of, I guess, role models or public figures, et cetera, which is why I've kind of taken the role, even though I kind of have no interest in it, in the sense that I really spend a lot of time working. Right. And just, so, you know, but at the same time, we'll make two hours on a night like tonight to come out right. and talk about the issue, because it's really important. Um, so, I... Not just on a night like tonight, you're leaving tomorrow <laughs> for your wedding. Yeah, that... I'm, I'm getting married. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I told Seth, I was like, I'm coming, but I got to leave real soon because I haven't packed anything. So <laughs> um, I, I think it's a critical topic. I think it's really important that everybody's here tonight, regardless of where you stand on the spectrum, because you need to not only learn, but you need to teach others. And if you're of some other minority community, whether you're transgendered or whether you're some other minority religious community, you're probably feeling a lot of the same feelings, and you're probably being targeted in similar ways. They might have real reactions, whether it's being treated poorly or not getting the job you want. So the next time that you feel a little funny towards somebody, you should have some empathy and teach somebody else about your own circumstances and, you know, spread the love. All right. So. With that, um, why don't we open it up uh, to audience questions? We have two microphones. Um, uh, this is being recorded. Um, so when you ask a question, please identify yourself uh, just so we know who you are. Hi, my name is Hisham Yusuf. Thank you so much for that wonderful commentary from all three of you. Um, I just had a question before leaving. Uh, so we talked about how, you know, is our existence as Muslims, uh, is it a political existence, and how does politics, politics play a role in our lives? And, you know, I was just thinking what you, you comment on sort of these systems that we have to live in, these systems that are oppressive, and, and, and oppressive not only to us as Muslims, but as our identities. I think everyone on the stage has a complex, multi-layered identity you know, Hisham, who's Sudanese, who's Arab, who's black, who's also Muslim, Layla, who's Arab, and American. Muslim, and a woman, <laughs> and American. And, and how, how do you and layer all of those things? And how do you kind of talk about, isn't our existence in itself political? And the actions we do, aren't they political in themselves, especially when we're coming from these marginalized spaces? And I just wanted to hear your comments on that. And just, when you say systems that are oppressive, can you explain that? Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to explain that. So, I mean, in terms of policies that, that are passed down on a local, on a regional, on a national level that press, uh, you know, communities that were, our parents are from abroad, from communities that we live in here, from housing and discrimination policies and housing and education and healthcare, and right. personally uh, in, in the medical profession. And uh, just, just the, the, the things we choose to do, whether we want to cover or practice our faith or fast in the hospital and how that affects how we're perceived in professional and personal spaces. And I think that those systems kind of place a weight on our, on our choices to practice or to affiliate with a certain religion or ethnic group right. or have a certain color of skin. That's what I'm talking about. Mm. Mm. Any replies, thoughts? No. no? 
I think it very much echoes a lot of the sentiments that we were talking about. Like, I think Hisham's comments came a lot from what he experiences, and I think effectively he's echoing the sentiment that as a young Sudanese Muslim American, he, you know, very clearly feels like there's some sort of politicization of his identity, whether he likes it or not. But um, my name is Omer. Uh, first of all, thank you for this enlightening panel. Um, so, as we're all, I guess, for the most part, MIT alum who are living in a progressive city like Cambridge. So I was wondering if we as Muslims run the risk of looking at the glass as half empty rather than half full. So for example, here at MIT, President Reif you know, has been very vocal in defending Muslim students. Likewise, uh, with Councillor Mazin, there was a hit piece that was run in Breitbart News. But right after that, his colleagues unanimous, unanimously voted in a um, they basically voted to condemn that piece and it was unanimous, unanimously passed. And this is after a very contentious election where there are not so kind words shared between him and his colleagues. So I, I, my question is, do you risk downplaying you know, all our allies by emphasizing the negative aspects? Like we talk about Trump, but we're not talking about Senator Sanders and his campaign and his message of positivity and his like attempts to reach out to Muslims to like be very vocal in supporting Muslims. So could you please comment on that? I mean, I'm, I should add, add the caveat that I am speaking as a male who's not visibly looking Muslim, who's living in a very progressive society with someone who's gotten opportunities more than like 99% of this country, so. Thanks. So. I, I would have to say that, okay, first of all, before I respond, I gotta say that um, that was a really awesome question and I'm really glad that you decided to uh, go against the grain and, you know, like, I guess the, I guess the crazy liberal media grain and, you know, like, um, bringing up this point. Um, and I think that uh, I would say, as a quick response, I would say that uh, we should do as much as we can to identify our allies, because there's many of them and they stand up for us all the time, even in ways that we don't even ever see. Um, and I think you bring a great point on that. Um, at the same time, I think that part of, and I think that as much as, you know, like, like if, you're, if, if you're a minority, you know, it's not that, that you have to have allies and you're done. No, if you're a minority, you have to have allies and you need to be allies for other people and everything like that. And I think that we need to be as much allies to other people as we can be. And I think that uh, part of being an ally is also understanding that as you get up to stand up, you, there's also, you know, you're, you're throwing away the level of um, recognition that you're doing it for. I mean, that's really what's also about being an ally. I think you can have both. You can have people both, you know, complimenting our allies and everything like that, and at the same time, you know, like allies not necessarily, you know, uh, asking for uh, recognition. Um, I think that uh, that being said, the positivity point only carries so far. Um, I would say that uh, highlighting people who we think are awesome and great and doing, you know, like really good stuff is very important. But it doesn't carry as far as you know, like uh, bringing up the specific points and the specific dangers that people face every day. And I think that uh, one thing that you could explain is, like, for example, like uh, there's 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 a uh, there's currently a cemetery being you know uh, built, Muslim yeah. cemetery cemetery in Massachusetts. Is it um, being built now? I know or, there's a. Oh, oh my God! Only going to be built in Massachusetts. Right. So I think, um, and and I've been in Milwaukee where they try to build um, a mosque too, and I've I've been to the public hearings, and it is a really really and hard the, process. The Massachusetts issue. Yeah. There's a huge debate, right, about Correct. whether it's going to be allowed. And, right, and, right, right, right. And it's literally like, and some of the comments were, you know, like, uh, you know, like, what are they going to do? They're going to build a cemetery here, and then they're going to build a mosque, and I'm like, as in, like, what's worse than a dead Muslim? Oh my God, a live one. You know what I mean? Like, but um, but I think uh, you know, highlighting those things, but you know, comparing that to say, like, you know, like. Roxbury or Cambridge and say, well, look, Roxbury did this and they accepted the mosque and it did well for them, or Cambridge did this and they accepted the mosque and it's good for them. Um, I think there is a very strong media point to be said for focusing on places like this where things are not getting done um, than necessarily saying, you know, like Roxbury did a great job. And that part of the story will come in later on. I promise you when they cut the ribbon, you know, and it opens up, places like Roxbury, places like, you know, like, like Cambridge and other places will be celebrated. Um, but I think highlighting the danger is very important. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think, you know, as I think I'm sure you mentioned in your question and you recognize there are a, there's a spectrum of, of vulnerability in many parts of the country, uh, in different occupations, there are Muslims who are more vulnerable, and it's important to highlight their opportunities. And again, I just want to echo the point of 
finding allies. That's really important, not only for the ethical and the moral and the religious mandate to stand up for what they're going through, but also I think very practically speaking, um, a lot of the media, certainly social media that we experience, there are these, you know, there are these echo chambers, there are these different lanes that people get their information from people that are, have very similar viewpoints. So I think from a very practical re reason, it's very important to identify key people in different, in, in, who can serve as different allies and get the word out. And I think that's really the most important expression of solidarity that as a non-Muslim one can make towards the Muslim community and, and vice versa is really sharing, us all just sharing our, our stories and our mutual understanding of, 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 of a mutual cooperation and kind of change, uh, challenging the narratives and challenging power structures that exist. Other questions? Yes. Um. Hey, Abu Bakr. How's it going? Um, it's funny to see you up on the panel because I'm like, oh yeah, I know you outside. But uh, I was just really struck by the uh, the first example you gave of um, a friend of yours at MIT who had the server in the dining hall yell at her, and and I guess partly what I feel is like. You know, I wish, if, if things like this are happening, I wish I knew more about that. I mean, maybe it's like a, one of a kind and then that's good to know. But, right. you know, if things like this happen, I'd like to know more about it. And so what I sort of wonder is, is there a way that, um, you know, we can, we can make, make people more aware that things like this happen? Because like abstractly, okay, by reading the news, I know, okay, there's probably some level of, Islam, there's a level of Islamophobia in America. But to actually hear a concrete example and, and like to think I could be, you know, I could be at an MIT dining hall. And imagine if I were at an MIT dining hall and, you know, one of the servers started yelling at me because of my ethnicity or my religion. And then to think that that happened. So I, I, I think it would be a good idea if, if there's some way to publicize the fact that something like this happened and... Mm. You know. That's a good point. As I mentioned, I was surprised to hear that. Okay. So yeah, so you know, uh, absolutely. And and I think you know perhaps like anonymous services like MIT Confessions, for example, could be a good outlet. Um, or perhaps there could be an outlet that you know different minority groups who experience this could just share internally. Um, but absolutely, I think you bring up a good point. Perhaps there is there's there's room for um, a platform where people can share stories and and bring it up to the attention of other students, faculty, administration. Absolutely. To kind of add to that, to not just this kind of idea of a platform or kind of spreading the word, and even to add to your, your first question in terms of, well, why aren't we talking this much about the good stuff that happens? Um, I, I do think that as young Muslims, I mean, everybody behind this stage at least, I know for a fact, does not talk about terrorism all day. We all have day jobs, and they're very busy, and we're all doing really good at something, and they're very diverse some things, right? And I think that we're at, a, we're at a time where more Muslims also need to be acknowledged for being something aside from being Muslim. Right? So, you know, if you're the best camera maker or whatever you do in that lab you know, all, in all of America and you happen to be a Muslim, I feel like we, we, we need to be sure to kind of help each other out with getting that type of press as well because there's a degree of humanization that comes with it. And what's lacking on a larger level is just humanization. There's a reason why some lady thinks it's okay to yell at a woman in her job for eating because she's Muslim and clearly she must be an alien. To his earlier point, he's never met anybody who's met a Muslim who hates Muslims, right? That's generally how hate works. So um, yeah, I, I think that in general, it's also a good idea to kind of not fixate too much on this conversation, but push your colleagues forward regardless of who they are and kind of get them that recognition in other spaces. Um, and as Muslim women too, I get so excited when I see people like Ibtihaj who wear hijab and they aren't just talking about how we're peaceful. She's like too busy beating the rest of the world at fencing, right? So I think things like that are really important. Sure. Yeah. And, and the case for, I mean, I think the proof of the Islamophobia, I mean, I think there's many ways of just, I think, proving it to yourself. There's very simple tests. I mean, you can walk outside and put on a hijab um, for, you know, just like... Try it for a few hours and see what happens. Um, and you'll report back on your results. I think everyone would love to hear Where's about it. guy, but... I mean, no, I mean, yeah. Yeah, let's take, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd also be like to hear that result as well. You know, like, I, I, yeah, no, no, but I mean, of course, to keep yourself out of danger. But what I'm saying is um, that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, there, 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 there are ways of looking at it. Um, I think uh, when, you, when, you, when you take a look at the, the, there's, there's individual aspects of Islamophobia. I can mention many of them. They're all very real. Um, and there's the, the individual, like, say, incidents. Um, but what I'm trying to say is, you know, that what we're looking over here is, like, this overarching, essentially, you know, like, um, level of environment of fear, which essentially prevents people from living out their regular daily day lives as Americans. And let me be very clear. 
being part of America means that someday you can hope to run for president. Um, and a great example, no, I mean, that's, that's, that's a thing. Um, and if you have, you know, people like, say, like Ben Carson, I was so disappointed. I'm sorry, it doesn't matter what Trump says. I mean, he's Trump, right? But when you have other people who follow, like, who, who, who run in line and essentially say, you know, like, I, would, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be happy with, you know, like, a Muslim president or something like that, uh, things like this, you essentially see that there's this aspect of fear which sort of hits up to the high level. Like, I can tolerate Muslims as long as they do this, or I can tolerate Muslims as long as they do that. But that's really not what people are asking for. And this is not really how you know, we should feel comfortable as being Americans. We should be ashamed of having anything less than accepting of all Americans. I think John Esposito said a really great thing once, and he essentially, um, in a talk, he essentially said, people being afraid of mosques being built in this country because they're afraid of terrorism is like saying people should be afraid of you know, like a Catholic church being built because they're afraid of child abuse. And I think that that's a really great point. Like, what is it that, you know, like, what blinders do we have on that have caused us to you know, essentially you know, seeing somebody else who, like, literally acts the same, lives the same. There's a poet named Nabil, he's great. He has a great poem about how he's just, uh, just like you, um, and everything is exactly the same, but yet is considered an other. And it, if it can happen to Muslims, it can happen to anyone. And I think that we just need to understand, like, what, what is the house that we're all building together? What does it look like? What does it accept and what does it not? And I think we think about it that way. Thank you for Yeah. Thanks. No, I'm sorry. That, like, it seems like part of the, what can happen is that, you know, maybe if I walked around looking like very clearly Muslim for a day, nothing would happen, but things happen once in a while, and it's those few incidents that can make, that can create fear. Hmm. Those few incidents not only create fear amongst Muslims, they create fear amongst people who are afraid of Muslims, because those people might see those incidents as, you know, a, for a reason effectively and, and well-intentioned, whereas Muslims see those things is terrifying. Like there's a woman who wore hijab who was slashed on a subway in New York within the last two weeks, literally knifed to her face, literally. Like, um, which terrifies me. I know I can probably fight back, but I think of my mom and just get very afraid. Um, you shouldn't have to fight back. <laughs> you shouldn't have to be in the situation. Right. <laughs> like, True. True, but then there's like this even kind of like larger trauma, right? Um, and the trauma is not only our identity and the way that we're perceived, but I mean, I don't want to take a toll in this room because I don't think it's a nice thing to do, but I bet if I asked how many people in this room had, that have actually been individually affected by ISIS, most likely only the Muslims would raise their hand. My best friend's mother was killed in Kabul, literally, by a terrorist attack. Um, I was almost killed in Baghdad. That's a whole other story. And I have a family member who was killed by terrorists, and it happens to be because I geographically happen to be closer in ethnicity to these things, and therefore these things happen. Um, and so not only am I constantly fighting this identity that's being pushed on me, but I'm actually facing the consequences of this crazy group of people. Uh, and I, I wouldn't be surprised, surprised if there were more Muslims that were affected. I can actually probably guarantee there are more Muslims that are affected by this than anybody else. Um, and so there, there really needs to be some sort of change in this larger narrative. Other questions? They can also be hard questions. We can, we can, <laughs> we can take them. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything else any of you want to add or that you feel like we've not touched on? Or do you feel like we have touched on everything in the history of the universe <laughs> in, the past, in the past 80 minutes? I just, I just want to echo Layla's point. I think it's so important. Uh, to uh, humanize the discussion rather than just focusing on a particular aspect of Islam and Muslims. Like just the mere fact that people are able to buy such simple binaries and just, you know, are just, just resort to very simple generalizations. It, it, the problem is that, you know, people are trying to, instead of like t t t dealing with this problem of, for example, terrorism, of bigotry with precision, they're just, you know, coming at it, axis swinging, they're just, you know, this, these, 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 solution, these problems require, I think, the precision of a scalpel. And instead, we're just swinging at it with huge axes and just like we're not, we're not getting anywhere closer to forming solutions. Instead, we're just perpetuating the problem because we, we don't understand really how um, Muslims in the U.S. think. We don't really think about how people in other parts of the world may think. So I think it's really, really important to just bring this discussion down to a human level. Anything else you guys want to add? It's okay to say no. It's totally fine. No. I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, thank you guys, honestly. Oh, you. I, I'm sure yeah. that everybody had other things to do tonight, and it's a really important conversation. And you should know that not only do I not hope that you will never be victims of some sort of otherization in the future, but if you are, many Muslims will be by your side. 
so including us. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thanks, you guys, for all for coming out. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, maybe we're preaching all to the choir because everyone's here, you know, trying to. <laughs> Especially, uh, it's also people watching at home. I think um, probably <laughs> that's the case too. Um, so the question, I guess, you know, that bec that comes up is like, you know, like how do you reach people who essentially are not of that mindset and who are not, you know, like um, along those lines? And I think it's really important to look at the, I think, statistics of it. I think that I don't know if anyone's done this plot, but if they can, you know, try to correlate, you know, Islamophobia or even a lot of like this hate speech to election cycles, I think that. <laughs> May bring up a. I mean, we have a joke in my house. It's like, oh, it's election season. No, it's Islamophobia season. Uh, it's not election season. No, it's that's a, it's that's like a season. I mean, it's like, of a joke. There. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, but uh, but I think I think that that is really interesting. And um, I don't know. Uh, maybe we got to ask a deeper question. You know, like um, you know, uh, why are we why are we doing this? You know, to to get elected. I think that's a really really hard question. I don't think that's the kind of place we all want to live in. Um, and maybe just to uh, continue on that point of uh, how do we reach people who aren't here, uh, I mentioned earlier that oftentimes social media acts as kind of a social, uh, of an echo chamber where you, you are restricted to people who share your own viewpoints, but I don't think that always has to be the case. Just this morning I saw this very interesting campaign by the country of Sweden to actually have a, they have the first ever national phone number. So it turns out that if you call this particular phone number, you can Google it, you actually reach a random person in Sweden oh, who has yeah. signed up for this app. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. And the reason they bring it up is because actually it has to do with election cycles. Socialism, all these questions about socialism are in the air. And Sweden wants to be, you know, they want to break down the barriers to understand, you know, a lot of people have questions about this. So you, you, now you have access to a live Swede <laughs> who, can answer, who can answer your question. And I think, you know, the, the, the important point that I want to emphasize here is that they had this nice video which went viral and through social media, they were able to reach so many people. I think it's important to start looking at that as a model and, and you know, uh, building off of that. And I think a lot of misunderstood, marginalized communities can follow suit. I think that answers his question in the blue to what the solution is. We have a call on the same hotline. Up, set up, set up, yeah, right, literally. Right, right. Well, random <laughs> call. call so, yeah. I mean, we, we, we do have a running program where any Muslim you approach, you can get tea from them. It's you get, can get tea. It's <laughs> very religious, religious mind it's, program. It's, 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 it's an obligation. You can literally talk to any Muslim. They will give you tea. You can mark my word. Any Muslim, any tea, any time, any tea. Not any tea. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, all three of you, so much for coming out. Um, this was, uh, I don't know whether it was preaching to the choir or not. Um, it was helpful to me uh, because even though I knew where I stood on the issue of the rhetoric and Islamophobia, um, I hadn't spoken with a lot of Muslims about their day-to-day -day experience. And I felt like it was difficult for me uh, to speak out to the extent that I wanted um, if I was speaking from a place of ignorance. So uh, I really appreciate all three of you coming out and, and sharing your experiences. Um, I thank all of you for being here. Uh, we do events like this three times a semester. Um, we have an email sign-up sheet right over there, and if you sign up, we promise uh, not only do we promise we will not spam you, um, you might even want us to email you more. Uh, <laughs> because we typically, you will only get about 12 emails a year from us. Um, uh, but, uh, and you can find all of our past forums online. Um, for many of them, there's uh, audio and video um, and a write-up. Um, and this will be posted likely early next week. So thanks a lot.